Thanks for staying with us on The Real Story. Fallout over the leaked draft of the U.S. Supreme Court's deliberations is reverberating across the nation. It's an emotional debate when it comes to Roe v. Wade. The draft shows the Supreme Court may be poised to overturn the longstanding ruling, which ruled the Constitution protects a woman's right to choose to have an abortion. So what was the reasoning behind that draft memo, and what does it mean for the final decision that's expected this summer? Uh, we all, we want to introduce Professor Stephen Gillis from Quinnipiac University. Uh, he also he clerked for U.S. Circuit Judge Robert Bork and U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. And you specialize in tort law as well as constitutional law, teaching at Quinnipiac University. And you have a kind of specially researched parental rights as well as uh, reproductive rights. Thank you so much for being on the Real Story this morning. My pleasure, Jen. Okay, so let's talk about this draft opinion. What is what is the process here, and what exactly is this document? So this was uh, after oral argument. The justices get together at conference. They briefly describe each one how they how they think they're going to vote and why. And then, uh, if as is being we're being told, if five justices said at conference, "Well, I think I'm going to vote to overrule Roe v. Wade," uh, then the senior justice in that group assigns the opinion to one of those justices. Then comes the first draft. That first draft is not only is it not a final opinion of the court, um, it doesn't have five votes when it circulates to the other justices. It has one vote, its author. And the justices will then read it, all the justices read it, and justices who had suggested that they would be in the majority will join it. They will send a letter or an email uh, to the author suggesting changes, and they'll circulate that letter to everyone uh, on the court. So this draft is back from February. Um, things the, the Alito's opinion may have changed substantially since February, but in addition to that, a lot of people speculate, I think with some reason, that the draft may have been leaked because if there really were five votes at conference to overrule Roe v. Wade, because maybe one or two of those votes, uh, of those justices is considering joining a narrower opinion, say, by Chief Justice Roberts. That's what this other leak has suggested. And that could very well be true. So we might be in a situation where, just to pick a name, where Justice Kavanaugh is thinking hard about whether or not to stay with this opinion by actually joining it, or whether instead to send his regrets to Justice Alito and join, hypothetically, Chief Justice Roberts' opinion, which would say something like, well, we're not going to overrule Roe v. Wade, but uh, 15 weeks is a reasonable amount of time for a woman uh, to decide whether to get an abortion and to have one, and so we're going to uphold this Mississippi law. So we don't really know what they're thinking at this point. We just know one person's opinion on the court. I think it's, I think we can reasonably say it may very well be true that five justices voted, at least tentatively, to overrule Roe, and then Justice Alito came up with this draft, which is his opening bid, so to speak. So he's going to send that to all the justices. It's possible he's gotten four firm votes already. It's possible. But if that, you know, so we can't, we can't be sure. Huh, interesting. Okay, so what happens after that? So is there any other paperwork that happens or any other draft opinions that are uh, formulated or is it just the final vote happens? No, it's, 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 a, it's a back and forth process. So the justices who are thinking about joining will, as I said earlier, will suggest possible changes to the author of the majority opinion. And, but then a dissent will circulate again, to, to the whole court um, at some point. And, and this opinion, this draft, um, would, would undoubtedly be changed in a bunch of ways in order to respond to arguments from, that the dissent will make. So when I've read Justice Alito's draft opinion, and there are issues he does not discuss, I think because he's waiting to see how the dissent addresses them. Um, so this is, as I said, his opening bid. This is an opinion that makes a, the affirmative case for overruling Roe v. Wade. 
uh, the author of the dissent is going to, if, there, if it's really a dissent, is going to be coming back with counter arguments. And that will change this opinion, possibly in important ways. Can you explain from a legal standpoint what the argument would be to overturn Roe v. Wade? Like what they're looking at in the Constitution that they feel it should be struck down, that someone would feel it, it, the way they're reading the Constitution to strike it down? So the core of the opinion uh, is that in order for a right that's not specified, that's not named in the Constitution, um, to be count as a fundamental right, which is what Roe said the right to elective abortion is, this opinion says the test should be whether the right has been deeply rooted, deeply grounded in our nation's legal history and tradition. This is a test that the court has sometimes used to think about fundamental rights. Justice Alito's opinion applies that test and says Roe got the history totally wrong. There were no laws authorizing elective abortions in the United States until the 1960s. So you can't say that there was a tradition of this, this uh, freedom as a fundamental right. Then he goes on to say that <clears throat> uh, this right, the right to elective abortion, is different from all the other fundamental rights the court has recognized. It's different because they all concern the liberty of individuals, but this one concerns the liberty of a woman to have a doctor take the life of a fetus. And Alito argues that that distinguishes abortion from contraception or consensual sex between adults or same-sex marriage, makes it a fundamentally different issue. Then he says, but if we don't overrule just any case that we think was wrong, we have a, uh, he suggests a test for deciding whether or not an established opinion like Roe with Casey um, is wrong and goes through a number of factors. And I'll just quickly summarize the, the guts of the analysis are um, this was a very bad mistake about a very, very important subject on which the country was deeply divided in 1972 and remains deeply divided today. And the court's reasoning was defective. Uh, and under, under these circumstances, um, even though it's been an established precedent, the court should take the step, the unusual but not, but not unheard of step, of overruling it. And he has a long, uh, a little appendix or footnote in the opinion listing many, many other important cases where the court has overruled the decision for those kinds of reasons. Professor Gillis, we only have about a minute left, but I was going to ask you about precedent. How impactful does precedent weigh in here? Well, you know, Jen, there's a lot of discussion. There's been a lot of discussion today about whether, if this opinion were to hold up and become the opinion actually of a majority of the court, uh, whether it would threaten other rights, like let's say the right to same-sex marriage. And <clears throat> here, I, I think what I'll say is, um, technically, the court could. Uh, can, could could take some of the language in this opinion and use it um, to call into question a right like same-sex marriage, but the opinion itself says that's not what we're doing. We are not questioning any of our other fundamental rights cases like same-sex marriage, and there are good reasons why that would be the court, I think, would not do that, especially that uh, many thousands of same-sex couples have relied on the right to same-sex marriage since 2015, to plan their lives, move, take jobs, et cetera. That's part of this analysis the court goes through about whether or not to overrule a past decision. And I think that, it's, that the justices would, uh, would not uh, consider overruling the right to same-sex marriage for that very reason. Professor Stephen Gillis, thank you so much for your insight. Really interesting to get into the nitty gritty of what they're actually looking at and what this draft opinion is. Important to note for everyone, if they do end up striking down Roe v. Wade, that would put uh, the rights into the state's hands. They, the individual states would decide uh, how they want to handle the issue. Right, St Professor Gillis? 
That's that's absolutely right. That's another key feature of the opinion where the court says we are returning this question to the people in each state. And here in Connecticut, we can be pretty confident that the right to elective abortion is going to remain. It may even get expanded a little bit. But in, in some of those uh, more conservative states, there's no doubt that the legislatures will pass laws prohibiting elective abortions or restricting them until early in pregnancy. Professor Stephen Gillis with Quinnipiac University, thank you so much for coming on The Real Story. We'll have you on again. And that does it for us on The Real Story. If you want to watch these segments again, head to fox61.com or download the Fox 61 app and watch The Real Story every Sunday at 10 a.m. right here on Fox 61. Have a great morning.